person, I must say, it's very strange to be in a different setting, but then again, this is back to my old roots. This is where I started off my career as a revision video maker. Ah! Yes, yeah, so very exciting change of studio, I'm sure you'll agree. So let's get on with what we're doing this video about. And the good thing is, it's actually a pretty good topic today as well. Okay, co-evolution. What is co-evolution? Co-evolution is the reciprocal evolutionary change of interacting species. This was a definition made by Thompson in 1994, and it's a pretty good def definition, although it doesn't necessarily involve species. It could involve um, interactions in things lower than species, so between individuals, or even um, between whole populations, but it's a pretty good definition on the whole. So it's involving interactions, so it would be a good place to start off looking at what kinds of interactions you can have between species in this case. So you can have mutualisms, that's when both species benefit. So classic textbook example being the, uh, the cleaner ass and some, I don't know, potato cod or whatever big fish that the cleaner ass wishes to clean. So the cleaner ass gets a nice tasty meal from all the disgusting stuff on the fish's body. And the host fish gets a free clean in the process, all good. So that's represented by the two positive signs here. You also get predation and parasitism. This is when one species benefits, but the other one doesn't. That kind of speaks for itself, really. There are loads of examples of that, and we're going to be looking at some later in the video. Um, there's also competition. This is when both species don't benefit. So it's when two interacting species um, competing for resources. So if the other one wasn't there, then obviously that would put the other species in a better place, and vice versa. So then both being there at the same time um, increases this competition. So that's negative and negative. Um, you also get other interactions, such as commensalism. That's when one species benefits, but the other one doesn't really have any effect. And a good example of this, I guess, is in the African plains where you've got your large megafauna stumbling through the grasslands, kicking up like insects and bits of food for um, small animals like egrets and birds to feast on. Great advantage for the birds, but, you know, the, your big rhinoceros or your, your antelope doesn't really get anything in return. We also get antagonism, so that's when one species is disadvantaged and another one has no effect. And this is mostly related with um, human interactions with um, wildlife, unfortunately. So, um, so, for example, fishermen catching um, species that they didn't actually want to catch by accident and inadvertently killing them. Well, big disadvantage to the poor sea turtle or whatever, but really no effect to us humans. <coughs> Now, in the context of this video, for co-evolution to happen, the interactions must be reciprocal. So, there can't be interactions where there's no um, advantage or disadvantage. So, we're talking about the main three here. These are all reciprocal interactions. The action of one either leads to an advantage or disadvantage in the other. And there are loads of different models in which co-evolution can happen. Probably the most exciting is what we call an evolutionary arms race. So that's when interacting species are constantly trying to um, outdo each other in the battle for survival. And it's this that we're going to focus mainly in this video. There are other models, so you could just end up with um, genetic equilibrium. So Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium basically, that's going to be our topic for the next video. You can also get continuous cycles, so instead of the evolutionary arms race where you get um, continuous um, better adaptations from the two interacting species, constantly trying to outcompete each other, instead you get a cycle which goes round and round. Another result of co-evolution could of course be extinction of one or both um, interacting species. But for the moment, let's talk about the exciting stuff, evolutionary arms races, and we're going to look through a few case studies in order to demonstrate this. The first being the interaction between bats and moths. Now, I've already talked about bats quite a lot in this series, but that's because they're pretty cool, aren't they? Um, we're going to look at it from a different perspective this time, in the um, perspective of co-evolution. So, bats like to eat moths. Moths don't like to be eaten by bats. That's the first point. 
And we know that bats locate their prey through echolocation. So they send off these high frequency noises which would bounce off an unsuspecting moth and reflect back back into the bat's ears and the bat will then be able to locate where exactly that moth is even in the pitch darkness. Now in this evolutionary arms race the moth has developed some pretty good adaptations to avoid being eaten by the bat. They have evolved ears which allow them to pick up the ultrasonic frequencies that these bats produce. And this has actually evolved more than once in a whole range of different insect taxa. In fact, it's evolved uh, more than once in the um, clay Lepidoptera alone. Um, and Lepidoptera is what includes the butterflies, the moths, etc. And these ears, each time they were evolved, appear in slightly different places around the body. So that's how we know that they've evolved more than once. So it's an example of convergent evolution. Okay, to demonstrate this, I need some sort of prop, which I don't have. Golly, should have prepared for this video. Okay, you're gonna have to make do with this. This is some sort of beetle on a piece of thread, but let's pretend it's a moth which has um, evolved these ears which allow it to detect the ultrasonic frequencies of this bat, a little um, deodorant can. So your moth is here and your bat is here. Now the moth has detected these frequencies um, produced by the bat but they're kind of very faint, so that gives the idea that the bat is quite far away. Um, so therefore, all the moth needs to do is to fly away, right, and for, fly further away from the bat so it doesn't get eaten. However, if the moth is close to the bat, so the, um, um, the sound of the ultrasonic frequencies um, picked up by the moth is louder, then just flying away may not be the best option because it may already be dinner by that stage because bats are very agile and excellent hunters. So what's it going to do? It's going to do this. It's going to drop out the sky and land on the forest floor. And these are called power dives or power spirals which speak for themselves. The moths actually spiral down to the floor. And they're a great way of disorientating the bat because then if the moth is on the floor then it's harder for the um, bat to pick up where it is. This isn't the only technique. Some moths even have evolved to produce these ultrasonic frequencies back at the bats themselves. This is called sonar jamming, which really confuses the bats. I mean, you can just imagine, can't you? Um, examples of insects which do this are the tiger moths, which in fact are toxic. They're, they're actually toxic to eat, and it's thought that giving these calls back gives a signal to the bats that you wouldn't not want to eat them anyway. Right, now this is a pretty good technique by these moths to avoid being eaten by the bats. So the bats must evolve something even better to beat the moths at their little tricks. And studies on the Barberstel bat, which is a common UK bat, um, after DNA barcoding analysis it's been shown that eared moths actually play quite a big part in the diet of the Barberstel bat. So these Barberstel bats must be pretty good at avoiding all these defence mechanisms that the moths have. So what have the bats done? What they've done is they've lowered the intensity of their ultrasonic calls. They haven't changed the frequency but just the intensity, so the loudness basically. So that means the bats can get a lot closer to the moths before the moths detect that the bat's there. So this is a great anti-defense mechanism by the bat. So that in turn will obviously um, induce a better defense mechanism by the moths and they'll carry on going and going and going in this evolutionary arms race. So you can see this reciprocal interaction between the bats and the moths. Obviously there are different selection pressures acting on the bats and the moth. And this is what leads to the idea of the life dinner effect, which basically says what it says on the tin. If the bat misses out on catching a moth, then it's just lost a tasty meal. If the moth makes a mistake and gets eaten by the bat, then it's lost its life. 
So there's a much greater selection pressure for defence mechanisms to evolve in the moths than in the bat. And it's thought that the faster generation time, so the rate of production of more offspring that's greater in the moth, allows for this evolution of defence mechanisms against the bats to evolve faster. Okay, we can scrap these now and we're going to go on to our second case study, which is on cuckoos. Everyone loves a cuckoo. If you haven't heard of a cuckoo, then where have you been your whole life? But yes, cuckoos are parasitic birds. They lay their eggs in the nests of other birds' nests and the host parent brings up their chicks, so they do no parental care whatsoever. They've got life pretty good. Now, there are loads of different species of cuckoo. Um, the ones in the UK um, normally lay their eggs in reed warbler nests, sometimes meadow pipits as well, but mainly reed warbler nests. Now, what that cuckoo chick does inside the reed warbler nest is um, pretty brutal. It knocks all the other eggs within that nest out of the nest. So that means it's only the cuckoo chick that's left in the nest, so it gets all the, all the attention possible by the host parent. Over time, this cuckoo chick starts to get much, much bigger than the host parent itself. So it's really quite amazing that this happens and whether <laughs> that these parents can be so stupid. However, the host species have evolved ways in which they can discriminate what is cuckoo and what is not. And it's all in their eggs. Their eggs have specific patterns on them. And it's these blotches on the eggs which allows them to identify what is what. So if a cuckoo was to lay their egg in the nest, it wouldn't look the same, so it would get chucked out. Um, this is not happening across all cuckoo species. It is happening in um, a species of cuckoo finch, which is another parasitic bird. So from this perspective, it looks like that the host species has the upper hand if they can discriminate from cuckoo eggs to their, from their own eggs. But actually, it's found that the cuckoos can actually mimic these blotches. So it makes it even harder for the host parents to distinguish what, once again what is cuckoo and what isn't. There is um, a particular form of egg which has only just appeared recently, it's sort of an olive green colour, where there are no records that cuckoos, or the cuckoo finches in this case, have actually mimicked them. So we could be looking, watching evolution in action of these cuckoos between their host parents here. Maybe in years to come, these cuckoos will evolve this sort of olive green egg so it can be disguised within the cuckoo, within, um, let's say, the reed warbler's nest. Now you might think, how come these host birds can look at the eggs and discriminate, potentially, what is cuckoo and what isn't, but when the cuckoo chick actually hatches out of the egg and becomes this big fat thing which looks nothing like the parent bird, how come that the, the parent, um, the host parent, hasn't evolved a way of distinguishing chicks and not the eggs? Because, I mean, surely that's the most obvious solution. Well, that actually comes with its risks. So if, let's say, a reed warbler um, is parasitised by a cuckoo in its first year of breeding, then the appearance of the cuckoo chick could get imprinted on the reed warbler. So that means in its second year of breeding, it would chuck out all of its own chicks, except the cuckoo chick, if it was parasitised again, of course. So that, of course, leads to a big, big disadvantage. So it's better to um, distinguish um, what is cuckoo and what isn't sooner rather than later, so just by looking at the eggs. And of course, if you wait until the chick hatches, then you're wasting lots and lots of time and energy by, um, you know, brooding and sitting on this foreign egg. So it's better to do it as soon as you see it rather than letting it to grow and develop. In Australia, there has been some evidence that um, the host species can actually identify the chicks and chuck out the cuckoo or um, cuckoo finch from its nest. So just when you think that the host species has got the upper hand again, of course, the cuckoo comes in running up from the rear and it's actually been found that the um, colours of the skin colour of cuckoo chicks and the host species look incredibly similar. God, so as you can see, it's a never-ending evolutionary arms race. One species is always trying to top 
um, the defense mechanisms of the other. It keeps on going on indefinitely. Okay, so they're the case studies, which are pretty cool, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, for the rest of the video, I'm going to be talking about mutualisms. Now, mutualisms are usually transitionary, so only occur in part of the life of an organism, but they can occur over a whole lifetime. And in this case, we call them symbiotic relationships. Good example being lichens. They rely solely on an ascomycete fungus and some sort of algae, cyanobacteria. Of course, endosymbionts, mitochondria in every single one of our cells. And of course, plant pollinators, insects and plants rely on each other throughout their lifetime. The plants need the insects for pollen dispersal, so to reproduce, and the insects need the plants to get um, nectar. So that is co-evolution, pretty amazing stuff, and probably the incidences when co-evolution is most accepted to be true is when the phylogenies of the two species look the same. So if we look at a molecular phylogeny, a good example being with aphids and bacteria, Back the bacteria produce an essential amino acid called tryptophan, which um, the aphids need for survival. So if you look at the molecular phylogenies of the aphids and the bacteria and you look at the speciation events and when in time they occurred, they seem to be pretty similar. So it's quite likely that the, uh, the aphids and the bacteria evolved in tandem with each other. So we can say there's high concordance between the two phylogenetic trees. Anyway, that's me done for today. Hope you enjoyed this video. Um, I'll be back next time. We'll do a bit of maths next time, which is going to be great fun. We're going to look at Hardy-Weinberg equilibria. But for the moment, toodle-pip. <laughs>